Right, so tonight's main, main event, um, delighted to, once again to welcome Professor Paul Callan. Paul is Professor of Physics and Astronomy here in UCC and he, over the last years and continues to be a very, very supportive uh, member of, of, the, of, of the club uh, and we're delighted to welcome him back tonight. So a very warm welcome to Paul. Thank you. So, uh, as always, it's it's a great uh, it really is a great pleasure to be uh, <coughs> here uh, uh, tonight <coughs> to talk to you. Um, and uh, you know, the, it's it's been a lot. I've been doing these talks for 25 years, thinking like 25 years or so with the club, and it's great to see it kind of going from from strength to strength. And usually the talks that I'd give would be to do with um, you know, black holes or telescopes or you know, modern astronomy. But tonight I'm going a bit outside of my comfort zone. Um, and really, uh, it's uh, Peter Household to blame, right? Because I, I gave Peter a series of potential titles. And so I like the one about, you know, I, I won't attempt to do Peter's accent, <laughs> but I do, rather like, I do like, I don't know, um, the one about the, uh, the medieval Irish monks, and so, uh, okay, okay, so anyway, um, and of course Peter isn't here either, after all that. Exactly, say what you want. Say what you want. So, um, now I'm a little under the weather um, this evening, so I'm going to be probably just doing it from the, the stool here, and <clears throat> the, the talk actually is not completely out of the blue. Um, because it's, um, it's based on uh, a, a, an invitation that was issued to me by the editors of a book on the, um, the Skeddig Islands, the Skeddig Michael, I guess in particular, um, a book that was published by Cork University Press uh, um, about a year ago <coughs> or so. And um, one of the editors approached me and asked me, you know, what about a chapter on the, the night sky um, from, from the skellies. And I thought, gee, that was a really lovely kind of atmospheric kind of an idea. And I said yes on the spot, but then kind of regretted it a bit afterwards because, um, because um, it's, you know, very little is known about certainly what the monks did, if anything, on the, on the islands. And in particular, what their interest may have been, if any, um, for the night sky. Um, but it's safe to say that the night sky on a clear night from there would still have been a very spectacular thing to have witnessed, as, as it is generally, you know, especially in Kerry and um, the dark sky reserve down there. So that motivated me to kind of change tack a little bit and, and write a, a few pages on not so much what the monks might have known on the Skeddig Islands about the sky, but medieval monks generally um, about the night sky. And so that kind of forms the, um, the genesis um, of, of the talk this evening. But I have to emphasize, I am very much outside my comfort zone on this. And there may be people in the audience who know much more about certain aspects of this than me. And if so, please accept my apologies in advance. And I'd be very interested to hear from you um, at the end, or even in the middle. So um, and I suppose to start off setting the, the scene, maybe, uh, kind of maybe <coughs> stepping back and looking about, I think we're talking about astronomy very briefly. Um, as far as we know what today is concerned, you know, and we have um, so many modern um, technology and examples of fantastic telescopes of various types. I'll talk about a few of them in a minute. But n not to um, lose track of the fact that all of the astronomy and the fantastic discoveries that we can make today fundamentally is still motivated by the fact when, when you look at the night sky, that everybody has this shared feeling of, of wonder and excitement and um, a willingness to just try to understand what the stars are doing there and what our relationship is to those stars, okay? And that's what really drives all of our high-end scientific and you know, technical innovation um, even today, that fundamental interest um, in, in, the, in the night sky. And 
you know, before talking about the monks, what have we done now? I mean, here's the James Webb Space Telescope, and um, uh, it's, you know, fantastic. Uh, you've all seen the beautiful images from it already, working primarily in the infrared part of the spectrum. That's going to be giving us fantastic astronomical observations and science over the next decade or two, hopefully. Um, telescopes close to my own heart, of course, the ones in the European Southern Observatory um, in Chile. The ones on the left and the lower left are, are, um, have been functioning and producing wonderful um, science and images of planets uh, orbiting stars and um, all sorts of breakthrough science over the last 10 years ago. The thing on the right is the European, is the extremely large telescope, which will have a mirror in it, which you can just about see in blue there, that will be 40 meters um, in diameter when it's completed in about four or five years' time. And, and we had an exhibit in Cork a couple of years ago, and I decided I'd ask somebody, it was somebody from the club, but I can't remember who, um, to put the, this European telescope in the context of um, City Hall, right? And even there, the perspective is a bit deceiving because the height of the extremely large telescope will be about the same as the Elysium Tower when it's finished in four years' time. Okay. Um, I've bored the club so many times about these telescopes and things. And of course, you know, years ago, we were trying to get into the European Southern Observatory and so we could access these telescopes. And, you know, and Ireland is actually a member um, as of five or six years ago now. And I think that's gone sufficiently well that the government now is taking the next leap and we're going to be joining CERN, right, um, very soon as well. And we can, we've made our observations not only in the optic part of the spectrum the eye can see, but in the X-ray, in the high energy, and there's all sorts of things um, that we can do with modern telescopes nowadays that astronomers even a hundred years ago, never mind one and a half thousand years ago, could never have possibly uh, imagined. And part of this, of course, is trying to understand what we can see out there and where, um, and the physics and understanding where it actually came from. But another part of this is its relationship to what's happening here on Earth um, from the point of view of you know, what we are made of and the various um, atoms um, that, we consist, that we consist of and how they were made um, via various processes. And there is this very well-known you probably all remember from school the periodic table of elements, so these are all the various elements there, but coded now in color is where these elements came from. And so most of the hydrogen came at the beginning of the universe in the Big Bang, but lots of the blue colored elements came from low mass stars, the yellow ones came from exploding massive stars, and there are other ones that came from um, certain types of stars that collided and exploded very, very dramatically. And so every little bit, every atom that we're made of, that we take for granted in the room around us or in our bodies, came from some of these very spectacular astronomical types of events which we're beginning to understand. And furthermore, even the more complicated biological molecules, um, there's very strong evidence that they already exist um, in comets and asteroids and in interstellar space. And of course, it's a live area of research as to whether or not these things actually reach the surface of the Earth and kick-started life on the Earth as well. You know? um, another related issue is whether or not um, the water on the surface of the Earth could have come from uh, asteroids and comets hitting the Earth as well. And so there's also this kind of secondary type of relationship that humanity has with understanding what's out there to see how it directly influenced life on the Earth, for example, and, and you know, other things too. And, and so that's kind of where we are today. That's where we are today. And there's black holes. I'm not going to, there's so many more things. But, um, but what we're going to do is to um, go back, as I said, one and a half thousand years and try to understand the people at the time and the most educated people at the time as far as I know were, were the monks and taking an example of those on Skellig Michael and, and even then, even though you know, they hadn't the technology, they hadn't the telescopes they hadn't anything like the tools that we could imagine 
um, using that we have today that I've just described, it was clear to them that astronomical knowledge was still important. And having some kind of crude models, model for the cosmos and for the universe was an important thing to have for a variety of reasons. And uh, I'm going to try to talk about some of those um, now. And this is the motivation, as I said. Um, I don't get any money or royalty from it. I'm still unplugging it up there for the two lads, John Crowley and uh, John Sheehan here in, uh, in UCC. It's a great book with absolutely magnificent pictures, most of which by Valerie Sullivan. Now, <clears throat> I suppose the first thing to ask, at least the first thing that crossed my mind when I was thinking about this, is you know, how does the medieval sky from one and a half thousand years ago compare to the, the sky that we, um, that we can see today? And <clears throat> there are some changes, but they're, they're generally not that significant. Now, one change is due to this phenomenon called precession. And I don't know, the observers in the audience who point their telescopes at stars would know a bit about precession and how um, you have to use this effect to correct for the coordinates of stars and planets that you're, that you're intending to observe. Okay? And so, uh, the, the, the way, I don't know how, whether it's, I'll try to explain it. So if you can imagine that the Earth is, is um, in my hand like that, and there's the spin axis of the Earth, and the Earth is spinning around the spin axis like that. Right? So there's the North Pole and there's the South Pole. And right now, does this even work? Well, there you go. So there is the, the, uh, the North Pole uh, of the Earth, and the North Pole almost points at Polaris, the North Star. Okay? I'll put Polaris, put Polaris there. Okay? Now, it's not exactly right, okay, but it's pretty close. Now, um, so, so the light on the ceiling is Polaris right now, right? And the green dot just represents the axis of the Earth pointing towards it. Now, um, the, the thing is that the axis of the Earth doesn't always point in the same direction. And what happens at over 24-ish, 26-ish thousand years is that it moves around in the sky. It travels around in the sky. Like that. <coughs> and so it might be here now, but give us 14,000 years time, it'll be over there. And another 14,000 years, it's back again. So it just happens to be pointing near Polaris there, but it doesn't have to, okay? And so what that means is that if you were to go around here, in 14,000 years time. So now the spin axis of the Earth is pointing there, right? And, but the North, our so-called North Star has moved all the way over there relative to where the spin axis is pointing, okay? So the pole star and all the stars move in the sky because of this, um, this phenomena of precession, okay? Um, and if you came back another 14,000 years, then it would have returned back to normal. So the position of the stars in the sky relative to the north, the north pole, to where, um, where the north is um, in the sky as we know it, uh, moves over this very, very long period. And so what that means is, and, but because this is over 25-ish thousand years, um, it's a very small change year to year. But if you go back one and a half thousand years, it's still enough to move the position of Polaris by about, what have I said there, eight degrees from where it is. So eight, eight, it's about 16 moons, okay? So where Polaris, for, the, for us, seems to be almost directly here, to the monks, for example, one and a half thousand years ago, it might be, say, maybe there, about a tenth or so of a movement in the sky. And that means the whole sky for the monks has shifted by that amount because of this effect of precession. It's not that dramatic because it's only over one and a half thousand years, but it is something that if you were to bring the monks here today and they looked up at the sky, they would very easily notice that something was wrong. Their sky had shifted, or ours had shifted, relative to theirs because of that. Um, <clears throat> now, th there are other changes as well that would have happened because of the, uh, some of the stars them individually move um, in space at, at relatively high speeds. And some of the speeds are so high that over 
you know, a thousand years, you might actually be able to physically see a change in their position. But overall, aside from the this, this shift that I'm talking about, the sky would look very similar to the monks back then um, as, it do, as it does um, to us today. So they would have been struck by the very similar um, star patterns, and they would have been measuring the, the, you know, the, they would have seen the constellations as we see them today, um, and they would have been measuring star positions and measuring planetary um, positions too. So that's the first message, I suppose, that the skies would have looked very similar to the monks in comparison to, to ourselves today. So then the next kind of part of the story is, well, what, what explains um, to, to the medieval astronomers and the medieval monks who were interested the night sky, and in particular, the, uh, the motion of the stars and the planets in the night sky. Okay? And so here, of course, one of the very big differences relative to our own understanding is that this was very much a geocentric model of the cosmos, putting the Earth in the center of, of everything, very sensibly. Okay? It's easy for us to say we can launch satellites and we can get outside the Earth and look back. But, you know, one and a half thousand years ago, why wouldn't you put the Earth at the center? Uh, but then you have to start trying to explain the motion of the planets in the sky. And one of the first things you've got to try to do is to figure out a sequence of the planets to try to explain. So here's the, the, their various uh, motions. So there's the Earth. Um, now I apologize. And Moon is the next in this sequence. And then there should be Venus, but that's somehow it's missing from this thing. Um, and then, uh, or Mar sorry, Mercury. Mercury's missing. And then Venus, and then the Sun here, and then Mars, and then you would have had Jupiter, and you would have had Saturn. So um, the medieval astronomers had a particular rationale for placing these various astronomical objects in, this partic in a particular sequence from the Earth. And the reason was, of course, they were trying to explain the motions, especially of the planets in the sky, which of course turn out to be um, particularly um, challenging for this kind of a model. So this is um, an example of, of the model I've just described. So here's the Earth in the center, and you've got um, the Moon, and Mercury, Venus, the Sun here, Mars, um, Jupiter, Saturn, and then the, the, the stars, the distant stars, um, on this, this distant uh, region. Now, the, the model that the Greeks had for, uh, for, for the, the cosmos was that these planets all existed on their own sphere, a celestial sphere, and I'll talk about those in a minute, um, with sometimes some fairly complicated motions that were needed to explain the observed positions of the planets in the sky as a function of time. The stars were easier to understand because the stars just rise in the east and they set in the west. There's nothing complicated really about their motion in the sky otherwise. So they could be fixed on this celestial sphere which simply rotated about the earth. Um, but the challenge, as I said, was, was the planets because um, here's an example, I don't know, it's red, so maybe this is Mercury, this is um, even Mars or something. And uh, and, and if you take an image of Mars, let's say, against a distant background of stars at one time, and then maybe a, a few days later, you see it again, you see it again. So here is Mars moving over the course of a few nights, and it would be fine if Mars kept going in a straight line. But occasionally, Mars, and as do all the planets, does this little loop, this retrograde loop, and then continues on its path. So clearly, you couldn't put the planets on the simple um, celestial spheres. You had to do something more, much more clever with them. And so the, the models that the Greeks proposed, um, and which would have been the, the cosmological model uh, of the monks in medieval times, would have been something along this line, where you've got um, a, a body, which is a planet, um, that's on one celestial sphere here, and it's going around it, and it's traveling around, I suppose, the diameter of the sphere, really, really, so like in a circle on the sphere. And then this sphere itself is moving around a second one, the deferent, here. Okay? And so depending on the motion of the planet 
on the smaller sphere, the epicycle, whether it was going in this direction or in that direction, it's either going parallel to this motion or anti-parallel to it. And so most of the time it will be going in that direction, but occasionally, if it's on this epicycle and going in this direction, it will seem to travel backwards on the sky. It's the combination of the motion around this one and the motion around this that if you tweak it just right, you can get a very good match to this retrograde, this loop-like motion of the planets in the sky. But you have to really tweak it. And the person who tweaked it the most successfully was Ptolemy, um, famous Greek astronomer. Um, and around 200 AD-ish, he produced this variation of the uh, celestial spheres, where, as you see, things are not quite centered. Here's the Earth. Now, the Earth, of course, was always fixed. The Earth wasn't moving. Um, but the Earth is not at the center of either of those two spheres, either this one or this one, right? And that was necessary so that the model produced the most accurate positions of the planets in the sky. And so this is the center of this sphere, the deferent, and this is the center of motion, if you like, of this sphere here. And by specifying that distance and that distance and a couple of the other geometrical angles there, Ptolemy could get a very good match um, that uh, enabled him to um, predict the positions of the planets in the sky with this model with good accuracy relative to what could be observed. And the, um, you know, as basic as it is, and, you know, bearing in mind the fact that you know, there's no real physics in that, Right? There is absolutely no explanation for why those planets should behave in that way. In any sense, it's a purely a, a, mo a geometrical model that seemed to work as far as the Greeks were concerned. It was phenomenally successful. It could predict the positions of the planets in the sky to the size of, to a distance comparable to the size of the moon-ish, um, over thousands of years. And it's hard to imagine any scientific work, and that's what it was, spherical trigonometry and all sorts of other geometry, that would still be used 1,200, 1,300 years later, right? All the way up to Copernicus. So it really was, although very basic uh, to us today, it was a phenomenal um, scientific uh, achievement. Um, um, and really, you know, it only really came into question um, when not only Copernicus, but when Kepler eventually said, actually, lads, um, not only Copernicus is right that the sun is the center, but the orbits, they're not only on these beautiful um, spheres, they're not even on perfect circles, they're on ellipses. It was only with those two insights that the predictive power of this model was finally beaten. Um, you know, one and a half thousand years later, well, not quite as much of that, but 1,200 years later. Anyway. So, so this was the kind of the general kind of cosmological background um, to uh, the medieval understanding of the night sky, and in particular the motion of the planets and the stars in the night sky. Now, and this would have been well known to, uh, to monks, and I'm sure even many Irish monks, too, back in the 500, 600, etc. AD timescale. But there was another reason why the monks would have been interested in, in the night sky too. And that was, of course, to do with Easter. Now, um, Irish monks, um, believe it or not, they were very good, and they were regarded as experts, in trying to calculate the date of Easter. Um, Early Christians, as I say there, had decided to celebrate Easter based on the resurrection of Christ, the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. So they gave the general recipe for it, roamed it, but didn't actually tell people how to calculate it precisely. And so as a result, many different places around Europe, and the monks specifically, spent an inordinate amount of trying, time trying to calculate the most accurate way trying to come up with the most accurate way to, predict, to reckon the date of Easter. And, and doing this was called the computus. 
And it's quite likely that computer and compute and words like that come from this, from the computers one and a half thousand years ago. Um, and doing this, as you might imagine, required a lot of elemental and important um, uh, mathematical knowledge and, uh, and especially the ability to do kind of complex arithmetic calculations. And indeed, it's, it's been speculated that, you know, back at this time, the work of the Greeks really was not well known at all um, to the Western world. And the computers, as, as carried out by monks in mainland Europe, and especially those in Ireland, was probably the main scientific endeavor of any um, going on um, in the world, as far as we would know at the moment. And so saying that Irish monks were good at the computers really means that they had a major uh, role and were uh, internationally recognized as, as people you know, on the frontier of, of science and mathematics. Um, as, it was, as it would have been known then. And just a, as an example of that, this is again something from, from Wikipedia. This is um, uh, a, a diagram that's uh, etched a table, etched in marble, which you can see um, in Italy. And these are all the dates of Easter um, for the years 532 to 526, um, calculated painstakingly. Using different, using a particular means of reckoning the time of um, the date of Easter, and I'll go into what some of those different kind of reckonings were um, in a minute. But just to say that you know this could actually cause um, some confusion, um, and this is one example. Um, so there was a famous king of England um, in the kind of the mid uh, 650s or so there, King Oswiu, and it was known that. Um, Sometimes between himself and his wife, um, well you can read it there, the king might seek to pay conjugal debt while the queen was observing a different Easter, basically. Um, and so that had to be kind of resolved somehow. And, and indeed, it was something, I mean, it's a slightly kind of frivol frivolous example, but it, it did actually uh, bring the king to uh, bring monks together to actually come up with come on lads, a proper definition of Easter that we can all agree on, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. And it's a similar kind of thing to the Skellig's Lists, which I'm sure some of you would be familiar with as well, the fact that a different Easter calendar used to be, um, uh, used to be uh, adhered to on the Skellig's relative to the rest of Ireland, which had some interesting consequences. <coughs> so, um, well actually before, I might just um, skip. So this is the, this is, these are some of the various ways that people had of calculating the, the dates of Easter. The, the Liturgus um, um, way of reckoning, which depended on a, a lunar cycle, which of course is <coughs> Easter at the end of the day and the phase of, phasing of the moon, which had a, a cycle of every 84 years. The Victorious one, which had a cycle of every 19 years. And then the Alexandrian one, which was improved by and Dionys Dionysius, also with a cycle of 19 years as well. And these were all being used, you, that's what you said, was that? These were all being used in various regions um, around Europe and within Ireland, uh, with no one coherent um, example. Actually, did I press that too early? Oh, yeah. I pressed it a bit too early. Come back up for a moment. <coughs> Um, so, for example, in the, the, 17, in the 700s, um, these three systems, the Victorian one was used in Southern Ireland, this one. This one was used in Northern Ireland, but the Turkish one was used in English and Wales, in England and Wales, and, you know, they were all getting in and out of phase, there was confusion. Uh, between them all. There's an excellent, now I'm taking from so many different sources here, it's embarrassing, but there's a really excellent discussion about all of this in this fantastic page here, irishphilosophy.com. Um, so, a, a particularly famous medieval monk at the time, the Venerable Bede, um, uh, was tasked with trying to knock heads together and produce um, from these what would be regarded as the way of calculating when Easter happened. And he did actually uh, achieve that, and they settled on this one at the end. 
for the expertise and the knowledge which Bede used to come up with the most accurate um, Easter reckoning calendar was from the monks, the Irish monks, because they were known internationally for their expertise um, in calculating um, Easter. And indeed, they had some very, very strong opinions about who was right and who was wrong in this, and they annoyed Rome um, um, about this to the extent that the Pope responded to them at the time, saying, not to think that their small number at the furthest ends of the earth were wiser than all the ancient and modern churches of Christ throughout the world. What were ye paddies talking about there? You know? um, but nonetheless, they were the, the, the tenure of that response really underlines the fact that they were taken quite seriously from the point of view of the expertise that they had in calculating the um, um, when Easter happened. So, um, and another important thing about uh, the calculation of Easter was that. Um, it was something that had to be promoted and explained to medieval monks kind of all around Europe. And the Irish were very good at developing essentially textbooks uh, to do this. And one of these is a textbook um, explaining uh, how to calculate the, uh, uh, East, the Easter calendar, written in 719 in Munster. It's called the Munich Computers. And it's really a very fundamental text which laid the foundations um, for calculating uh, Easter in medieval times. Um, and, um, and I'll talk about another version of this in a minute as well. And eventually, because of the expertise of the Irish monks that Bede could draw upon, um, it was decided in the early 700s, as I said, that, um, that, that uh, one particular uh, Easter calendar would be chosen, and this is the one that's still, the one that he that Bede um, promoted based on the expertise of the Irish monks is still the one that's being used by the Orthodox Christians um, today and um, the Catholic Church diverted from that a couple of hundred years ago. Um, but it was something that um, was, um, as I said, uh, that Irish monks really um, spent a lot of time uh, contributing to. So that, that was one thing, the calculation uh, of, of Easter. Now, another matter is uh, astronomical then. Uh, another um, individual who had um, a lot of um, uh, expertise um, in astronomical observations, of course, was, was this fella, um, who would be, people of a certain age would remember this, of course. Um, and this is um, Erin Eugenia, who was really one of the greatest intellectuals of the medieval age, and John the Irishman. And um, kind of intellectuals in continental Europe couldn't, they marveled at this barbarian coming from Ireland, uncivilized, who knew Greek, the audacity of him. But, um, but he was a highly original me metaphysician and a speculative thinker, and, of, and also thought a lot about, um, about the medieval astronomy and the cosmos at the time. And, um, some of his writings were interpreted as saying that maybe Mars and Jupiter orbited the sun. Now, of course, this is a very big deal because if you're... Um, the astronomy up to this point, of course, had everything in a nice sequence. Everything was going around the Earth. Okay, but here he's... Peep him and there were one or two other people at the time as well. I said, well, maybe, you know, it's possible that some of these planets go around the sun. Now, the sun still goes around the Earth. Right? They couldn't get their heads around the fact that the Earth could also go around the sun. But maybe some planets went around the sun. And so he, he, he people, there was speculation, uh, depending on how you would interpret his writings, that he was actually um, suggesting that the Mar Mars and Jupiter went around the sun. And of course, he would have been spot on. He would have, um, ideas like that would have been, you know, a thousand years ahead of Copernicus. Um, Another, um, somebody with more, more specific um, astronomical expertise is the following individual who is called upon by Charlemagne in 1810 to explain how there were two solar eclipses in that year. Now Charlemagne um, was concerned that this was an omen and of course astronomical observations like this were very, and I'll go back to this later on, were very often made looking for omens of various types. And so Charlemagne was concerned that maybe 
two eclipses in one year was a bad sign of some sort. Or could it happen naturally? Okay? So he needed our world expert to tell him um, you know, what the deal was. Did our current cosmology allow two eclipses to happen at the same time? Um, and the man he called upon was an Irish guy, famous Irish monk, Dongle the Recluse, who was then resident, uh, a monk in Saint Denis in France. He was a poet, a theologian, and very, very well, well versed in astronomical knowledge. And he, so he got his request from the King of Europe, and he responded, as you can see, with the epistle of Dungal the Recluse to Emperor Charlemagne regarding the two weeks of AD 810. And it's all, it's all online. And the letter, of course, he couldn't resist showing off and how much he knew about the universe and the details of the universe. And he went through eclipses and all sorts of other astronomical phenomena and his own favorite kind of uh, organization of the planets around uh, the Earth at the time, etc. And he showed that indeed, Charlemagne could relax, that it was possible that you could have two solar eclipses in the same year, based on the astronomical knowledge of the day as well. And Dongle even said that, you know, future eclipses, even thousands of years away, could be predicted by someone following, and I'm going to mess up my Latin pronunciation here, what's that? Sejasum Explorationum et Diligitem Observationem. Intelligent Investigation and Industrious Observation. Okay? Now, this is, all of this predates the scientific method. This is 1,000 what's this, 1,200 years ago? But he's absolutely right. That's how all scientists do it today. All right? Diligent observations and um, industrial and uh, intelligent investigation and industrious observation. And, uh, and I don't know why. I, at this point, I just include this, okay? This and the understanding that comes of it leads to this, all right? We can predict all these things now. So eclipses. He wouldn't have been surprised, and there's an eclipse right here in Cork, not a huge one, but uh, 8th of April, a partial solar eclipse. As I said, Dungle would, have, would not have been surprised. Um, <coughs> now, <coughs> it is an unfortunate thing, this is the, kind of the third topic now here, <coughs> it's an unfortunate thing that we know so much about what the monks thought about the night sky. <clears throat> but we know so little about what local people thought um, about the night sky. And a lot of the, the native Irish folklore and tradition from this period is just gone. So, um, now, we had a, I don't know if any of you were lucky enough to come to Sean McEntehig's talk last year in UCC. He gave a superb talk about the Irish folklore kind of west, but, you know, Cork, especially Kerry, but that's only going back 100 years, maybe 200 years. Anything from this long ago, as far as the folklore is concerned, just completely lost in the midst of time. Primarily because the monks weren't interested in, in writing any of it down. They were much more interested in the co cosmology as understood by continental Europe and especially under the influence of Rome. And, but because they paid such um, um, gave just such a high value. And they had a couple of really important texts um, about that fundamental understanding. And there's a very famous book called The Irish Astronomical Tract, um, of which three copies um, still exist today. And these are late medieval texts in Latin, translated into Irish, some of them. Um, and they're based on an Arabic uh, treatise by Masha Allah, an astronomer from about 800 AD. And these are phenomenal books, because here now, there, there's a page from it, trying to explain um, eclipses. And here's another um, sequence of planets um, relative to the Earth. And there is a phenomenal amount of knowledge about phenomena that really boggles the mind in this book. Okay? 
It covers, okay, the Ptolemaic universe, which you'd expect, explaining the motion of the stars and the planets, various types of eclipses, the nature of stars, which in this case were stars shone by just reflecting um, the light from the sun, um, the precession of the Earth's spin axis, the waxing and waning of phases. Now, we know about the phases of the moon. We can see that, right? You've got the phases of Venus and Mercury, right? Now, someone was talking about using binoculars earlier. The phases of Mercury, you've got to try with binoculars. Okay, it's fantastic. It has the same phases as the phases of, uh, of the moon. Mercury also has phases as well. That you, uh, much harder to see because Mercury is always so close to the sun. But this was all discussed in this thing, even though they were really only observable with the te when the telescope came around 300 years later. So there was a prediction, right, in, in, this, uh, in this text, um, which nobody could actually verify until a long time afterwards. Now, the best preserved of these um, <coughs> texts was actually transcribed by a scribe working in Fermoy, a wheel lane, I guess, line. And this is in the Royal Irish Academy um, in Dublin. And the cover of this particular version of the, of the, of the astronomical tract includes what's a, a rotula, which is a rotating device. And here it is. I just wrote it. And it's basically it's this thing that rotates around this way. But depending on where you rotate it, it enables you to calculate the position of the sun in the zodiac throughout the year. And it could be Ireland's oldest scientific instrument on the cover of this version of the astronomical tract in Dublin. Okay. Now, <clears throat> with all of this, I suppose it's, it wouldn't be a surprise that some Irish monks, there are fantastic records of them observing the night sky. And there are many, many astronomical examples in the, in the famous Irish annals of astronomical phenomena, um, various types of eclipses, aurorae, uh, and other transient ev uh, events in the night sky. And it was something that was done very, very systematically from about five or 600 AD up to about 1,000 AD, if I'm recounting things correctly. In fact, I've got up to about 12th century here. And, and so one reason is, you know, why were some of these Irish monks so um, assiduous in making these regular observations of the night sky and looking for these unusual phenomena? And it's, it's likely, it's been speculated that one reason for this is that they were looking for phenomena that could be interpreted as a religious sign. I suppose a bit like Charlemagne and his two solar eclipses in the same year. Could there be some phenomena um, that you could see that might actually be so unusual you think that has to be a sign from God um, or of some sort? A portent of evil. And indeed the word disaster can be traced, thank you very much, from the Greek for bad star, okay, dis as, aster, star, right, dis aster, for bad star, or evil star. And of all the astronomical phenomena observed by the Irish monks, um, you know, they observed things like, for example, the appearance of Halley's Comet um, in, in 1066. And there is Halley's Comet, of course, from the bio tapestry. And it's, it's, it, it was suggested, although I think it's probably fair to say nowadays maybe it's not, um, it's not um, it, the evidence isn't as strong as people were hoping to start off with, that the Irish monks actually saw the beginning of, could have seen the, the, um, the beginning of the Crab supernova explosion in 1054 AD when it first um, actually appeared on, on, the, on the sky. Because in the annals there's a, a very, very dramatic, um, apocalyptic, I use the word there, description of a phenomena in the sky which scholars originally attributed to the possibility of them seeing the actual crab supernova occurring before their eyes, maybe even um, in, um, uh, in, in Offaly, uh, which of course the irony there is that 800 years later, um, William Parsons, the third Earl of Ross, 
actually named the crab supernova the crab supernova. And it's quite possible um, that in the same place um, 800 years previously, um, that some monks actually saw the explosion where it was formed. It's not clear that the records are right with the year, but there are other aspects of it that are not consistent, not consistent with it. Um, but the point is that whatever about seeing the actual explosion, the, it's likely that the crab supernova would still have been visible um, in the daylight sky, um, relatively near the sun, for weeks afterwards. And so, if you were a monk looking for a portent of some incredible thing that was about to happen, and you saw this really bright star in the sky, even in the daytime, appear from nowhere, you know, that would make you think it's going to happen. Is the second coming around the corner? Um, but of course, it wasn't. And the, the, the records, the, uh, the astronomical records in the annals, kind of drop off very significantly after this. So it's almost as if the monks kind of gave up at that point, that they just didn't think that, you know, if this wasn't the second coming, this crab supernova explosion, this new star you could see in the daytime, then maybe there was never going to be a sign um, in, in, in the night sky about that. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of all I have, really, on the, the medieval side of things. The post-medieval, of course, um, stepping up several hundred years um, after um, uh, kind of the, this, this, um, this time scale uh, as far as this particular interpretation of the cosmos is concerned, Galileo would have actually pointed a telescope um, at the sky. He would have seen, he did see the phases of, of Venus. He saw the moons orbiting uh, Jupiter and speculated amongst many other things that if um, Jupiter actually had these objects orbiting around it. If it was the same of its own, if it was the center of its own kind of system like that, surely the sun could be the center. What was the problem with having the sun as the center of the planetary system that we know as the solar system? Couldn't the sun have planets as its satellites? And of course, he was really looking for evidence that supported Copernicus's, Copernicus's heliocentric model, um, and it got him into trouble. Right. with the Catholic Church. Um, and then, um, uh, I said, well, not quite in parallel, but um, and, um, uh, Tycho Brahe um, was also trying to find uh, evidence that um, confirmed the heliocentric model and that Copernicus was, was correct. And he measured planetary positions with the naked eye in this case um, very, very accurately indeed, and handed those positions to Kepler. And Kepler really, uh, as I said uh, a little while ago, was the one who said, look, these planets are not only orbiting, the, the, you know, forget about the celestial spheres, forget about the planets even moving in perfect circles. These planets follow orbits that are slightly, very slightly elliptical. And with that one insight, he was finally able to, um, to dramatically improve the accuracy with which the positions of the planets could be measured in the sky. If you remember, I said for 1,200 years before this, Ptolemy's work had predicted the planetary positions in the sky to within the diameter of the moon. Okay? Kepler finally was able to improve that to perfection as near perfection as, 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 as you can do by factors of a hundred or a thousand. Okay? And it was only at this point that humanity finally had a model that was better than Ptolemy's over the previous 1,200 years. And really, it was with, with Kepler that uh, we had the first real quantitative demonstration of the importance of mathematics to all of this, and especially to the, the workings of the universe at large and, of course, uh, on all scales at the end. And, um, and I suppose a point here on, on, the, on the dark sky, because I, I last gave a talk similar to this to the lads in Kerry a little while ago, and just that, you know, the measurement, the, uh, the, this importance of the night sky motivating us as the way it motivated um, the monks 
and people who lived in the medieval times. It's the same thing at the end of the day, and it, we're, it's not going to have that impact. We're going to be missing something absolutely, you know, terribly fundamental if we let it be taken away from us from the point of view of, of, of night pollution, etc. And so it's really important that uh, efforts are continued to just keep the skies as dark as possible, certainly in more rural areas and whatever can be done as well uh, in urban areas too. And, um, and I think that's it. That's it. So thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. That was absolutely fascinating. I never realised that the monks were so active in astronomy. I, I would have thought that they would have followed the diktat of God made heaven and the earth yes. and that's all you need to yeah. know and even trying to figure it out was almost trying to understand yeah. the, the workings of the mind of God which could be yeah. blasphemous no? yeah, almost yeah, yeah. Um, well I think as long as they put uh, see, I guess because the models um, they ha had no real uh, they were very um, geometric but there was no real explanation for why they moved the way that they did, for example. Um, there was plenty of space, literally, for, for God to be involved and to, uh, and to be the agent that kept these things in motion around each other, etc. Um, but the other important thing is, I guess, that, you know, these guys had tremendous intellect and capability, um, even then, um, and, uh, and the Greeks, especially, in producing you know, all the, kind of the mathematical... Um, geometry and spherical trigonometry I mean it's um, we might think of these things as something that you know it's on the school syllabus from and maybe people have known maths, mathematicians have known about these things for a couple of hundred years but really the mathematical expertise of the Greeks was just incredible 2,000 years ago okay okay um, any questions on yes, all, of, all of that Yes, exactly. Yeah. And of course, the story is with Copernicus that he was so afraid of the um, impact, the personal impact it would have on him, that he left the publication of his heliocentric model basically to his dying days. So that if the church did want to do something, he wouldn't be around. Or yeah. um, but there's no doubt that that, that was probably a, a hindrance, I guess, yeah. um, in the development of a proper heliocentric model for a long time. Jeffrey? Uh, thank you very much. Fascinating. Uh, there are two bases, or well, probably several, uh, uh, for all the wonderful theories and ideas that they had. Um, and that was that they could measure, I suppose, yes. angles Correct. and time. Correct. And how did they do it at night, measure time? Well, they would have had some... It's a good question. I, I remember trying to look into how they, um, how they could uh, make clocks, you know, even back then, whether they were just water clocks or other types of very basic technology. I mean, some of these things that they found over the last two or three thousand years, these complicated clock mechanisms, they clearly was a lot of technology then that they could use to have clocks that were accurate enough to give them at least a measure of um, the, the equivalent of the longitude, the, uh, longitude of the star on the sky. And then for the latitude angle then, they, you know, a standard technique there would have been to um, build a, uh, a, a large metal arc and put it in a wall with an angle on the side, right? And you just kind of sight when a star transited across that. And so, with any kind of illumination, you could have measured that angle, I guess, as well. But the, the technology behind the accurate clocks, that's a good question, and I don't have a specific answer I'm for that. Water clocks, uh, Maybe water clocks, clocks yeah. Did they have a pendulum? Oh, they would have had, say they would have had pendular clocks as well, yeah. But it's just correcting, they'll all be slowing down, and you need to have ways of 
correcting for all of that. And the, I'm sure they have. They must have had when you see what they were able to achieve. So, yeah. Up the back here. Um, I have a question regarding the rotula. Yes. The rotula. Um, yeah. Um, which is just you. You were saying it was on the cover of this volume. Yes. Do you mean? A diagram of it, or was no, actually the actual, it part of the construction? It's, it's, of it? part, it's part of the cover, mm -hmm. I understand. Okay. Yeah, it's actually right there. So um, I've never seen it in person, I have to say. So, and so. you said it's in the Royal It's in the Royal Irish Academy, as far as I know, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Mm. For something so advanced, you think we would be better known, wouldn't you? It's amazing. There you go. Maybe yeah, it should be in a proper museum rather than exactly. this kind of thing. Any other? Oh, do you have a record? Do you know what is a record of any native Irish terms, constellations? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, the um, the nearest I have to any of that again is a, a copy of the talk that um, the RT journalist Sean McIntyre gave to us uh, whenever that was in September of last year, where he goes through many of the the old Irish names of various constellations, a couple of constellations, and the Pleiades, and the Milky Way, of course, and things like that. I, act, I don't, I'm, I'm, I have them on the memory stick. I wonder would Sean be terribly... We won't tell him, I promise. He's such a fantastic guy. He'd be somebody else. If you weren't able to come to uh, Sean's talk, he'd be a great person to um, to come and talk to here. Uh, okay. So Orion's Belt and Dagger, there you go, all sorts of various things from Munster and Mayo and Clare, just for Orion's Belt and the, and the dagger there. Um, let me just see if I don't find anything else. Oh, unknown stars. Here we go. Sorry, I scooted past all of these. So that's what Sean would tell you for the Milky Way. <coughs> you know, a lot of it is to do with cows and cows looking across the universe and <coughs> from the others on Budok for the for Orion. This talk was great and it gave explanations for the names. It did with them as well, yeah. Yeah, you should try to have them here. Yeah, that's a great idea. And um, what else do we have here? The role star, the, the pole star, on real to Hui, of course, yeah. Kasakama Korkon. I, I, see, that's where you need the explanations. So the answer is there is, we have a select, but this is still only going back 100, and, 100 years, 100 and whatever. Um, and before that, it's just gone, you know. And I've, I've been on to him because you know, if any of you use this, um, this Stellarium, this fantastic Stellarium ad, um, app, Mm -hmm. um, that um, there's a, a, a kind of a section there about the folklore um, of the night sky in various cultures and I've suggested to him that he should have an Irishman for that you know, even going back over and something years Great, okay uh, Jerry, did you have a question? No? No? And, any others? Yes, at the back Yes sir Yes, um, oh. Thank you for the talk, it's excellent. Um, just one question there, with the Abbey Cycles things, I yes. know that didn't concern the Irish on Scotland question, but it, it sounds that it's so regular, it would be hard to explain by a continuous rotation of the thing around the place. I mean, it happens once every Earth orbit, I presume. Well, the... Right. And it, 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 it shifted by the movement of the planet each time. Um, so, is, are you saying that the... The model will be too regular for what's observed, or, or that that would be very hard to fit into a regular model because it is going this way there for a while, then it goes back to the middle, and then goes forward again. For most yeah. Of the time. Yeah. But you're saying that they actually were able to. But fit they were, yeah, <coughs> and, and, and fit it very well to within, as I said, you know, half a degree or a degree or so the diameter of the moon. But I mean, the fundamental motion is because you've got. Um, I, I don't know. I'd need. To, uh, I've had too many hand waves around, but I mean the thing is you've got you've got one motion that's like that, and the small circle, and then it's going around something here, right? So it's spiraling around like that. And so there are times when the object is moving in the smaller orbit in that direction, 
And that orbit itself is also moving, right? And as long as that's happening, it's moving in the same direction in the sky all the time. But occasionally, the object that's going around like this is coming towards me, but its orbit keeps going that way. And so there is, so now it has this kind of composed motion that's in the opposite direction. You can consider that in reality, it is a combination of two orbits. It's a combination. That's true as well. It is the both that's true. It's happening all the time. It okay. happens so irregularly. Oh no, the, so what's irregular now? The actual... No, I mean it happens, it, the, the movement back is a very small amount of the total. Correct. So, but if it's going around all the time, how come it's not... Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. 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 All, 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 I, all I can say is, they were clever guys, and they were able to tweak it so that they could... And that's the thing about a model like that. It has so many, what we say, free parameters, that you can make almost anything fit to anything. Um, as ingenious as it was. But the real genius came up was really when Kepler got his insight and then Newton came along and said, not only can I, you know, Newton said, look, I can tell you why these things work the way they do. It, not, not just a prescription anymore, but the actual fundamental physics of why it happens. And then we finally had a proper picture, but it took us one and a half thousand, one thousand three hundred years from Ptolemy, you know. You're saying that the Irish monks were able to observe as accurately the they were able to, uh, well, I don't know how much, to be honest with you, I don't know how much observations they actually did, but they had the mathematical ability to understand okay. those models. Yeah. Anyone else? That is? <coughs> Paul, once again, thanks for No, not at all. You're very welcome. Well. I'm it's sorry it's I have to run now, but anyway. You know, when, when you're not feeling the best, nah, no, you okay. still come in and yeah. give the lecture. Yeah. Thank you no, very much. Very, very well. A small talk of a very ah, <laughs> 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 yeah, Exactly, yeah. I won't open it until I get home. <laughs>